Welcome fellow explorers. I'm Richard Garriott, president of the Explorers Club. Today we have a very special live broadcast coming to you from Explorers Club headquarters, uh, also Washington DC, and most importantly, out on expedition coming to you live from Greece. Uh, we have an incredible underwater Explorers Club uh, members who are out uh, on expedition inside Titanic's tragic sister ship, the Britannic. They're documenting what has never been seen before, partially funded by the Explorers Club Discovery Expedition Grants. Uh, the team, in partnership uh, with a wreck owner and Greek, British, Northern Irish governments, along with support of the National Museum and the Royal Navy, have been granted permission to go back to the world's largest ocean liner to explore deep inside the wreck. Over the course of two weeks, they've been penetrating far into the collapsed decks of the crumbling hallways of the lost liner to seek answers. You know, why did uh, she sink so much faster, even after all the modifications had made, been made to her after Titanic's loss? Uh, what did the, do, the crew try to do to keep her afloat? Uh, and what can be extrapolated from the loss of this, uh, the loss of Titanic, uh, from this tragic loss to the uh, loss of the Titanic, uh, after we kind of compare those two expeditions together, those two uh, tragic things together. With us today is both the expedition team as well as its leader, Evan Kovacs. Uh, Evan, by the way, is an underwater explorer, photographer, and uh, science communicator with over 20, um, 20 years of underwater experience. Uh, he has led uh, scientific and photographic expeditions to the Britannic, Titanic, USS Arizona, as well as other unique archaeological uh, sites as a, as a trusted collaborator. Um, it's worth noting here that in 2009, Evan was here with Carl Spencer, who unfortunately died on the previous expedition to this site. The Explorers Club then retired flag number 68, which, by the way, uh, in honor of this uh, discussion, we hung here behind me in the president's office of the Explorers Club. Uh, and Evan worked, Evan and his team worked for 11 years to, to secure the permits to return to the site and complete that expedition and have with them, as you'll see behind them, a flag number 160. So by the way, this is a, an incredibly important, incredibly historic uh, Explorers Club uh, uh, expedition that we're, we're so proud to uh, be able to bring to you today. But before we go to Evan and the team, let me first invite Rebecca Martin, uh, who's both an Explorers Club fellow, as well as she's the consulting director of the Explorers Club Discovery Expedition Grant Program. Uh, who has been working uh, with our in-house uh, uh, team member, Emerald, uh, on the grant program to tell you a little bit about that program here now that we're really right at the first anniversary of those Discovery Expedition grants. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, and um, thanks uh, to Evan to, and his team for being available today for this really exciting opportunity re live report from the field. Um, and also to Emerald Nash for her incredible work on the Explorers Club Discovery Expedition Grants. As Richard mentioned, the program was launched a year ago. We're now 21 projects in and a million dollars uh, spent on these incredible projects covering terrestrial natural history, the human story, which is archeology, span anthropology, um, space research, including Ed Lu's mapping of uh, asteroids in the solar system, and Nina Lanza looking at uh, the chemistry of life on Mars, and then also natural history in our oceans and seas. And we we've supported an incredibly outstanding and diverse group of grantees representing 11 countries, including team members, 17 countries around the world. Um, and 16 of the projects have already, despite COVID, been able to head into the field, including Evans. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that because the results are starting to, to come in. You'll be hearing more about these uh, projects and, and the grantees in the coming weeks uh, with a press announcement, but please do in the meantime, spread the word about the program, encourage people, you know, explorers, you know, to apply for these grants, uh, go to the Explorers Club website, um, uh, the grant section and uh, encourage them again to, um, contact Emerald and uh, discuss the opportunities. So 
Now we'll hand it over to Evan and team in the field. Um, congratulations on what you've accomplished so far. We're really looking forward to hearing about it. Uh, Rebecca, thank you very much for the, you know, one, the grant and two, the introduction and, and Richard, the same to you. That's a, it's an incredible uh, intro, which uh, my mom would be very happy to hear. Um, but uh, I wanted to um, uh, just express uh, my personal gratitude, especially for uh, bringing up Carl's flag uh, behind you. Uh, that was retired when he passed away. And I'm going to start with None of us at this this entire table would be here, uh, both in our diving careers and certainly not on this wreck if it was not for Carl. And this is this this project is quite literally an extension of uh, a vision and a and a dream that Carl had to go inside and map the Britannic um, in a way that had never been done before. And we are we're all uh, individually and collectively, I mean, really honored to finally after so many years uh be able to start that process and and even more importantly it's it's even more collaborative than it was in 2009 and we're working with you know governments museums and hopefully we'll be cutting through all of the the red tape that goes around this thing to help conserve the legacy and the story of britannic which is i mean everybody's familiar with titanic of course but britannic has a very um a very different and a, and a very singular story that uh, we're, we're hoping to uh, help tell through the, the things that we can find and, and ultimately uh, give back and show to the public. Um, like any expedition, an expedition is, is uh, always standing on the shoulder of people that went before it and also uh, rubbing shoulders with the people that are part of it. And, you know, we have a, a fantastic team of people here and I'm going to let everybody sort of introduce themselves and, and tell you a little bit about who they are, where they are from, and, uh, and also why uh, Titanic is, I'm sorry, Britannic is, uh, is, uh, is, is important to them. But um, before we uh, do that, I also, um, we have, we, we are in the uh, just absolutely beautiful island of Kia uh, in Greece. And one thing that is very different about this expedition than our previous is that we are we're working with local collaborators um, and we're going to introduce them in a second as well but we're actually in a technical dive shop which just that that didn't exist it wasn't even on on the radar uh, uh, when we first started doing this everything that you see behind us all the tanks the compressors etc we would have to bring in ship in and expeditions cost quite a bit more than and were logistically a lot more complicated um and uh our, our hosts Giannis and george have made that quite a bit easier and uh you'll introduce uh, well they'll introduce themselves in just a minute but beside me um uh there's four or five of us here from the explorers club that are all members and uh, I'll let them sort of go around. This is Richie Kohler. Thanks, Evan. I'm Richie Kohler. Um, I've been a member for almost 20 years. Um, I came here about 15 years ago to Kia, Greece to explore Britannic after in 2005, actually being on Titanic. Um, there were questions about Titanic that we came here to Britannic to answer. And I fell in love not only with the Greek people and the, the people of Kia, but uh, with the wreck itself, uh, where Titanic is dark, deep, and, and obviously you need a submersible. As an underwater explorer, the ability to swim through the corridors of Britannic is, is exactly what, to me, underwater exploration is about. It's about getting wet and getting, getting inside. So um, this is my fifth expedition here. I've been partnered with many of these people. There's a couple of new people here. And with that, I think, Eduardo Pavia has been here longer than anybody else. Well, yeah. Uh, um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Eduardo Pavia. Uh, I come from Italy. And as uh, Richie was saying, I've got uh, six expedition on my back, which makes me a bit like a dinosaur. But, the old uh, man. The old, the old man, man, yeah. And um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm grateful to the Explorer Club for this opportunity. And I'd like to say hello to everyone that is following this uh, this uh, uh, program at the moment for following us and encouraging us to do our best and 
Now I think it's time for Michael to say something. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Barnett. Uh, I've been a fellow since 2009. And uh, this is my fourth expedition to Britannic. And each and every time, it's always a pleasure. And uh, it's gotten progressively better and better. We're getting more and more discoveries and more exploration uh, under our belt. And uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here in, in Kia. Um, hi, I'm uh, Barry McGill. I'm an um, Irish-based uh, deep wreck photographer. Um, this is my first time diving the Britannic. Um, it's a real privilege to, to dive the wreck, um, having dived loads of shipwrecks around Ireland, like Lusitania, to, to come here and, and dive another wreck that was, that was built in Belfast. It was really special. And then to dive with a group of people like this that I've I suppose, always aspired to, to get on an expedition like this. So it's a, a real uh, special uh, trip. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Yanis uh, Zavalakos. I am coming from Greece, from Athens, but I've been living mostly here on the island of Kea last uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm the owner of the local dive center, Kea Divers. Um, I'm a primary diver, diver as well, but uh, in this expedition, I'm not diving. I'm uh, coordinating the surface support, logistics, um, human and material resources. Uh, it's a great honor uh, when uh, Evan Kovacs and Simon Mills uh, contacted me for this expedition. Uh, and it's a very uh, important responsibility also for me to deliver what uh, I have to. Uh, obviously, uh, it's not a one-man show here. We have a group of uh, persons that uh, everyone is dedicated to his task and we all work as a team all together to deliver uh, at the highest level. I hope we go on um, the following days uh, in, in, in the same way we did so far. Alex? Um, hi, I'm Alex Frenzel. I'm from Connecticut. This is my very first time um, near the Britannic and on an expedition of this kind. Um, I'm a support diver here, so I don't go anywhere close to the wreck, but I spend a lot of time with the divers during their decompression, being their communication with the surface and taking any additional gear that they need taken care of and helping Giannis with surface support. Um, I'm really honored to be here with this group and so early in my wreck diving career, just hearing their stories and getting this experience. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Richie Stevenson. I'm a UK based camera operator. I'm here working with these guys, which is fantastic fun and a real privilege for me also. This is my fourth trip. My first one being in 2003. So after 18 years, I still find the whole experience just as magical as the first time. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Simon, Simon Mills from England, and I'm the poor individual who actually has the dubious title of being the owner of the Mecca Botanic. It's a long story and I won't go into to that today. Um, I think I'm actually the old campaigner here. Uh, I've actually been to Kia now on 10 Botanic expeditions throughout the years. Um, I actually bought the wreck in 1996, um, which was a year after my first expedition with Bob Ballard. So if I've got it right, I think I'm probably the only person who's ever bought a shipwreck as seen. Um, but it's, it's a great honour and sometimes a little bit scary to own the Botanic, um, but it's wonderful to be working with a dive team who really know what they're doing because it's now reached a stage where I have to hand it over. I've done all the paperwork, we've got all the permits sorted, I'm briefing them where to go, but ultimately it's now all in their hands. There's nothing more I can do except sit back, look at the video and say, yeah, great, well done. But I have to say that so far, they've really um, outdone themselves. I'm thrilled with the way that things are going. So thank you very much. Stu. Hi, I'm Stu Andrews from Ireland, Dublin, Ireland. And uh, it's an honor, as everyone has said, to and privilege to have the wreck. Uh, it's actually my second trip here. The first one was only partly successful, so it's fantastic. There's such a super team. Evan, I'll name one or two people Evan and Yanis and Kia Divers. They're, they're really very key to what's going on here over the last few days and the next few days. So thank you very much. George. Hello everybody, my name is George Van Doros. I live and work in Greece, I'm a diving instructor and my role here is uh, surface support. 
I'm coming in the island from uh, 2008, exploring various wrecks, including Bhutanic. Uh, I was present in the islands when uh, in 2009, and um, uh, I'm really happy that I'm back in the island uh, now after all these years. So to be a part of this expedition continuing after the initial start in 2009, and uh, and I say that everybody is wonderful, everybody is really powerful people doing a great job, and I'm uh, happy to be here. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Pilotowski, I'm a US-based diver, and here as a support diver for the first time in Greece and on any expedition. I'm also assisting in data collection with Divers Alert Network. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Poppy Tillmans, I'm the research director at Divers Alert Network, Beginning of the year, Richie uh, Fuller sent me an email. Um, we, we hadn't met yet, and I couldn't believe that I got this email. So he wanted us to be part of the botanic expedition and do some research, as uh, my predecessors have done before. So uh, my job here, with the assistance of the wonderful Peggy, is to um, measure the compression stress and everything concerning the hearts of these uh, divers here. They all have one, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, that's what I can say. Cool. Well, that's uh, that. That's the core team. There's a uh, there's a uh, other people sort of uh, involved on uh, you know around the uh, around the outskirts, but but this is this is the group that's uh, pretty much out at sea. Every day, and uh, one of the—I mean, one of the things that I we always—they've—they've they've introduced themselves, but we can never um, sort of express enough gratitude uh, about is to the safety divers and our support team here, because they—you um, know—it's—it's it's one thing to go down, and people are always asking, "Oh, well, you know, what's it like?" Well, you know, you'll go down and do 30, 40 minutes on the bottom, but then you'll have anywhere from three to five hours of decompression coming back up, and there's no communication between the surface except through our uh, the eyes uh, of our support team, and they they shuttle gas, they bring food, they bring water, they they do whatever it is um, we need them to do. I mean, uh, even the other day, uh, Mike Barnett had a cramp. George came down and rubbed his leg. So <laughs> that's uh, it's really uh, it's pretty kind. <laughs> that did happen. That did happen. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is pretty casual, but we sent over uh, a lot of unedited B-roll footage, and I think we're going to play some of that, but, and we'll just sort of, uh, it's a it's a fairly free form thing here, and we're just going to sort of talk about uh, um, what we're seeing and, you know, what it has to do with, uh, with an expedition. Um, and so, first of all, we're, we're here, this is, this is what it looks like in this area during the day. Um, Kia divers. Uh, this is first day, the very beginning, and uh, even though uh, Giannis and George have this incredible sight, we still all have to bring our own kit in. And you'll see us in the background, uh, you know, prepping rebreathers, prepping cameras right here. We're pumping up oxygen for our rebreathers, and rebreathers are pretty key to us actually being able to do a mission like this. Um, Rebreathers allow us to, with somewhat minimal logistics, be able to go down for, you know, uh, and spend hours in the water and not have to carry the amount of tanks that we used to have to carry in open circuit. Um, it's Eduardo, uh, sort of putting one of, one of his many rebreathers together. Uh, <laughs> the, the logistics of, of this type of diving is, is daunting. I mean, each one of us have to bring hundreds of pounds of material. Not only do we bring our rebreathers, but backup re uh, regulators, computers, lights, cameras, backup lights, reels, uh, obviously uh, exposure suits and underwear. I know that the water is quite warm here, but most people are surprised when we tell them that we wear dry suits and heavy underwear, because even though the water temperature at the surface is 76 degrees, down below on the bottom, I was getting temperatures inside the wreck um, in the high 50s. So it's, it is cold. And during that time, one of the things about decompression is you want to be um, as comfortable and warm during the dive or during the decompression phase as possible. So there's a lot of gear, a lot of equipment, all of it has to be sorted, checked, and then double checked uh, before we even think about loading the boat. 
Yeah, and and most of the gear that we see here does end up on the boat, um, which which makes it a little crowded. Yeah. But um, and that's actually one of the things that is you know uh, great and different about this. We're actually uh, Giannis and George arranged for you know a, a, a what did you it's a, a Greek a, a, not a classic what did you call it a, a traditional a traditional Greek fishing boat yep. that was converted into a dive boat. So. There's some great pros and cons to that. They are incredibly seaworthy and reliable boats. Um, they do roll a little bit, and it's not what we would be used to sort of in the English Channel or back home where it's a rear entry and a rear uh, exit where we'd come up and down the stern. In this case, we're jumping off the side and we're climbing up a side ladder. So on a nice calm day, you know, I mean, even, uh, even your grandma could do it. But uh, uh, in the Kia Channel, they Your often- grandma's pretty tough. Well, that's true. <laughs> she, she is kind of tough. <laughs> um, but but uh, in the Kia Channel, you know, you'll start off on a flat, calm day. And, uh, and then in the afternoon, you'll have four or five foot seas and it gets a little um, sporty, as they say. What, what you're seeing now is that's Giannis. He's bringing out an analyzer. And one of the obvious big logistics of this dive is breathing gases. And uh, right now he's he's showing the uh, the dive team and the support team, I believe, uh, ways of analyzing or pressurizing uh, cylinders with oxygen. So and and there you can see some of the compressors and boosters that we use. So um, although the rebreathers that we use are incredibly efficient and basically use very small amounts of gas during the dive, we have to be prepared for a rebreather failure. And in that there are going to be literally dozens of scuba cylinders that are filled, analyzed, and carried by not only the dive team, but put in place by the sport divers throughout the phases of the dive, only for the case, or, or in case, one of the rebreathers malfunctions. Uh, to give you guys an idea, when we're diving to Britannic, we can do the, all, the entire dive with two cylinders on the side of our back that are about the size of a, a liter Coke bottle. So you have a liter Coke bottle of oxygen, you have a liter Coke bottle of diluent, you can spend about eight hours in the water and get out and you don't need anything else. But if that rebreather fails, each diver will need anywhere between seven to 11 cylinders of gas, different uh, oxygen contents of gas in order to safely make a decompression uh, ascent from Britannic. So when you think about it, we have to be prepared for at least two divers to have a failure at the bottom and safely make it to the surface. So the logistics of all of this gas management is fell mostly on Giannis. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we, we take it for granted. Every single cylinder has been not checked only once by Giannis, but also by another member of the team and then labeled. Um, this is in direct relationship to the accident that ultimately took Carl Spencer's life in 2009. Um, when he was breathing off a mislabeled cylinder. So one of the things that a lot of people ask that aren't in the technical dive scene, and I'm imagining some of you guys uh, watching this are not technical divers, is that, um, you know, we're all used to breathing air and people are always like, oh, if you go diving, what do you carry oxygen? And you're like, well, sort of. <laughs> um, yes, we do carry oxygen, but oxygen actually becomes toxic and can kill you via, you know, once you get to depth. Um, and we put other, so we put, um, uh, we carry one uh, on our rebreather, we carry oxygen, but then we also carry a diluent. Diluent is a mix of nitrogen, oxygen, and helium. Everybody is probably familiar with uh, narcosis or, you know, the, the martini effect of going deep on air. Well, what happens is you, you literally, you begin to lose some of your cognitive functions. And uh, what we do to combat that is add helium. But because we're going deep and because oxygen at certain depths. <laughs> yeah, obviously uh, that guy doesn't have any cognitive function. Yeah, right yeah we don't have to worry about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, helium doesn't help on the surface. I want everybody to know that, okay? Um, but we, we, we constantly, we have to analyze every last thing that, uh, that, that goes into the water and that, that we could possibly breathe. Um, and that, that's a pretty critical function. Um, of, of our sort of pre-dive, uh, of our pre-dive. Now, right here, 
We're, this is part of the science. I know it doesn't look like it's part yeah. of the science, but it, it actually is. It, we should let Dr. Falcon say. I was exactly just about what, to say. Why don't you tell him what's going on? Okay, what's going on? So you see uh, Richie Cola naked for all of those who Nobody wants to see Richie to, Cola to naked. See that. Um, what we're measuring here is anthropometrics. So we're looking at body fat, um, which obviously he doesn't have. Yeah, I was a winner. He paid me to say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, what we're also measuring on this expedition is uh, heart function, and uh, we're taking rest EKGs in the beginning of, uh, of the whole expedition, and then once again after the expedition is done, um, the divers must be by now because I make them do uh, cognitive function tests. They really don't like that. <clears throat> but uh, this is all science, it's all for the good. Uh, what we also do is measure decompression stress after the dive, and um, that is done by cardiac ultrasound. I'm not sure if we have footage of that uh, in this video, but I'm basically looking at the bubbles in the heart um, every 20 minutes after the dive until they subside. It's um, pretty exciting to be here and to do this on these, uh, these very experienced divers um, on all kinds of different decompression profiles. And uh, seeing what what comes out in the end is uh, a really exciting experience. I know that's been one of the exciting things for all of us too. Is uh, you know Dan um, Dan has been a I mean a huge. Uh, well, uh, their insurance for us in case we ever do get bent and have to go to the chamber. D Dan meaning but, Divers Alert Network. Exactly, and uh, we were we have been partnering with Dan on, I think almost every Britannic expedition that we've done uh, since 2005 anyway. And it, it's kind of neat because uh, over the years, there's been different types of, of studies that have been, uh, that they've been, they've been doing. And it's important as a, you know, as we're sort of the, 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 get, the older part of the, uh, the di getting into being the older part of the diving community here to, constantly um, give back and sort of feed back information into the into the decompression model um, and uh, you mean like Stewie and 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 Ido when you say the older diver well of course right? yeah 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 okay. no, I'm, I mean I'm, I'm it, it's kind of sad that uh, I still get called a kid at, <laughs> uh, at 47 I don't think I'm the youngest anymore but no, the, the, we, we, we've got a whole new group coming up <laughs> in the back there so yeah um well, yeah, this is uh, so right now what we're doing actually is packing scrubbers. So again, like the way rebreathers work, um, everybody's seen scuba where you're basically blowing bubbles into the water column and and that's it. You get one breath and then that's the end of it on a, on a rebreather. We actually uh, it's a continuous it's a continuous loop. So we breathe in, it removes the carbon dioxide and then puts in a little bit more oxygen so the, that we can uh, sustain life. But what we were seeing packed up there, uh, that was uh, that was the scrubber for the rebreather. Now we're going to see. You seem um, very infatuated with my nakedness. I just want to say that. I, I just a little. There was so many other people here, but why did you only film me naked? Because I was. Uh, this was the one time I happened to be free, <laughs> and I was like, somehow it's a lot more entertaining uh, <laughs> watching Richie's nipples get, uh, <laughs> yeah, get, yeah. Thanks, get pinched uh, here. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Well, but yeah, believe it or not, this is all all science. And and you know, obviously, at some point we're going to be talking about the science of what we're doing diving. Um, but you know, this is obviously has an impact not only on an aging diving community, but understanding or trying to understand the physiology of decompression. I mean, j just this afternoon, um, doc Dr. Tillman was explaining to me that. They understand why it happens, but they don't understand how certain things, our body, um, how these bubbles form or where they go and, and, and why they come back out. And, you know, some people have them, some people don't, they go away quicker. And this is where this baseline research is helping them uh, um, kind of get a better handle on it. Of course, I didn't, I don't think that was the most eloquent explanation. I'm sure you could have done a better job, but that was that was completely accurate. Oh, wow. <laughs> One in a row. <laughs> I'd like to add uh, another comment that it probably can can be interesting to understand this activity compared to other explorations. Uh, uh, exploration in diving uh, as the request of very sophisticated and complicated equipment. So it, to all of us, it seemed 
pretty straightforward, but uh, the truth is that we are not far from being close to someone that goes out of, in the space to astronauts because Absolutely. we are entering a world where yeah. we can't breathe. And so we have to be able for, as, as it was mentioned, four or five hours to, to be able to stay alive by ourselves. So this equipment is sophisticated. The amount of equipment that has to be deployed is very sophisticated for a, a quite short amount of time of exploration, right? because we're talking about 30 to 40 minutes of exploration. So diving is a bit something that sometimes is, um, is difficult to understand to someone that is not practicing it, but to the extreme limit, the equipment uh, plays a huge role in the achievement of, of, of what we have planned. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's also the skills of, of the people, like in any exploration, like in any activity, uh, extreme activity, but in this case, also the equipment plays an enormous uh, role uh, with which, you know, without which it, it wouldn't be possible to achieve what we are doing at the moment. Uh, no, absolutely. That's great. Um, we're going to show a little bit of uh, underwater footage. And this is uh, just a whole bunch of camera raw from a number of different cameras that, uh, that we grabbed. And we'll, we'll try to uh, narrate uh, as best we can. Um, but the purpose, we, you know, the purpose of this particular project is to go inside and map the interior of Britannic. Um, and, but of course, to get there, we, uh, we travel on the outside. Um, we're not, uh, due to our permits with the effort and with everyone, we're not going to be showing uh, any interior footage right now. But uh, just some, some interesting spots that'll give you a, a good idea. What we're seeing right here is part of the old funnel. I believe this was uh, uh, shot on the first day. Of course, this is part of the anchor. Um, and we, uh, we, we basically on our, on our very first day, uh, with Stewie, Barry and uh, Mike Barnett, uh, particularly because Stewie and Barry hadn't, well, Barry's first trip, Stu hadn't been here in a long time. We, uh, we had them go up to the bow and do a little exploration up there. There's a couple of things that we wanted to look at and, and debris piles and stuff like that. So they were able to go up and, you know, make sure it's still there. Um, but remember, but, shipwrecks age just like people. And we, had, we hadn't been here uh, since uh, 2016. So one of the things about going to the bow was also to just see how the wreck has aged before we start our interior penetration. Every, every time we come here, we, we never know when the wreck may uh, biologically implode. And so uh, this exploration and uh, obviously imaging and uh, hopefully targeting certain iconic uh, artifacts for hopeful recovery for placement in a museum is paramount because what you're seeing in this incredibly beautiful shipwreck uh, may not always be here. It will eventually collapse upon itself. And these artifacts and some of the images that we are getting on this trip will never be seen again. No, I, I, absolutely. Um, and I mean, we're, I think what we're looking at here is some of the, uh, some of the, I think this is part of the promenade deck, uh, but down on the sand. So earlier we saw some big windows and stuff like that, but this is, uh, um the promenade from down down below um and uh we have some extreme close-up so often one of the things that we do with uh with this type of expedition where it's not really a a filming expedition per se so we're not out to capture uh we want good quality overall but we're not trying to capture you know cinematic um images is we are leaving the camera rolling the entire time so that people that are analyzing like Simon and, and others uh, later, hopefully it gives them context and they can, uh, you know, go to the plans and, and start filling in where, where they think we are and what they think they're looking at and we're looking at. So uh, often when we're trying to get into spaces or go under, the camera's just rolling, uh, which is basically what's happening there. This is the promenade deck from down in the sand. Um, at almost 400 feet. Yeah, at, yeah, it was like 300 and, you know, 80, 90 feet, something like that. And it looks very dark because the ship is laying over um, on her starboard side. So above us is 100 feet of ship. 
the 10 stories of shipwreck is is above both Evan and my head right now. And um, that that's me and moving away and gives you a, a sense of scale of this uh, very wide promenade. This is, I think, coming out from that promenade. But yeah, it's important to say that, as you can see from the images, uh, this line that is deployed is the line that guides you towards uh, uh, the exit or the entry, whatever <laughs> it is. And uh, as you can imagine, as you penetrate the wreck itself, you will uh, uh, disturb the elements over there. And so not only you are deaf, not only is it complicated, when we all take a ferry or a, or, or a ship, we know how it's easy to lose the, 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 the door in which we are sleeping, the cabin that we have. Yep. So try to imagine on a, on a, on a huge vessel like uh, Britannic, how easy it is to get lost. So uh, sediment uh, uh, complication on, on, on navigating. Uh, it is absolutely fundamental to deploy this line to be sure to be able to come out from. Uh, Did you mention that it's pitch black in there too? There's no lights, right? <laughs> no, no the light. light at all. Yeah, there's no light, by the way, guys, too. Just in case yeah. you didn't get that. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes I, I think to myself, you know, when I'll be a bit older and I will not be diving anymore, some of this picture that remains in your, your in your mind, at least for me, some of the most terrific. <laughs> nightmares to be stuck down there so. yeah well, well you know you're swimming down a hallway and and uh you know you're like well yeah there is literally hundreds of tons of metal just sitting above you and you're like and then and then you know part of our exploration here is to go into the engine room and uh which which we we've just got into today for the first time and you know but but you're swimming under engines with a ship that's on its side and you know you, you try not to think about it too much but you're like you know the ship is really on its side and the engine's just kind of kind of sitting there what's what's that you know like they have the you thing know, they call the butterfly effect for starting a hurricane well what's what's the butterfly effect for like making this engine fall you yeah, know don't, and, don't touch it yeah, yeah don't please, touch yeah. don't anyway so um I don't well, know wow that. that that is already fantastic evan and uh to all of you uh there in greece as i see the sun is setting down there behind you uh, you know, what a pleasure this is to be with you. Uh, by the way, we do already now have questions coming in from the viewers, but I would like to take presidential privilege and, and uh, throw a couple <laughs> at you myself first. Um, uh, and, and, and actually, my, the first question I had made myself notes for uh, was kind of a duplicate of uh, Brian Kovacs, who's also uh, asked, so kind of uh, I'm, I'm adding to his. Um, which is, we understand that it's a deep and technical dive, but can you tell us a bit more specifically about both the, the, the depth of the wreck, the top and bottom of the wreck, uh, as well as, you know, what does a dive profile look like? How long does it take you to get down? How long can you work? How long to return? How many stops? And where are you staging some of these uh, decompression bottles? And are, do you have safety divers with those at the stops? Can you describe a, a day or a, a cycle of diving? Absolutely. So uh, the wreck, the wreck starts at about um, 300 feet, give or take, you know, 290, 300, somewhere around there. And so uh, the first couple of days, our line actually went down into the sand. So our dive started at, at basically 400 feet, which is not the way we really like to do it. So what we did is we moved our line up to the top of the wreck. So we had the opportunity then of staying high because there is a hundred foot difference, which is a massive difference in the amount of decompression. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, today, Richie and I did uh, almost 35 minutes, but we were high on the wreck and we had a four hour runtime. We did 35 to 40 minutes a couple of days ago, but we were almost entirely on the bottom and that added another hour and a half of decompression. So, I mean, generally, you know, you're, you're, you get down relatively quick within three to five minutes, well, five minutes, you're down on the bottom, you're doing your exploration, and then you're spending anywhere from three to five hours coming back up. And we only carry, because this is a, um, a supported expedition, meaning we actually have dedicated support divers, which is such a luxury. Um, we carry just two bottles each, or Eduardo carries a, an extra rebreather. And then we stage bottles um, on the way up. And then we have what we call drop sets. So if there was another emergency, we can drop gases down to people 
Um, and we have, a, we have a system for alerting the surface for the different emergencies that we might have. For, for the six divers in the water, there's seven people in two different boats supporting us. Um, George is primary in that after he deploys all of the divers from the main boat, then he sets what's called the decompression station and the primary bailout gas is deep on, on a secondary line. So that if one of the dive teams was to have an emergency, we could self rescue to about 120 feet. At that point, if they didn't do this, we'd literally run out of breathing gas. So it is paramount for our safety to have not only George laying that out, but then we have Katie, who's what we call the deep support diver, who comes down at a predetermined time when they are expecting the entire dive team to be at a certain point in the water column. At that point, she's actually carrying more breathing gas in case there was an emergency. She not only checks on the team, but then she starts taking away some of the bottles of gas that are no longer necessary. As I mentioned earlier, that varying mixtures that we would require at different depths. So once you've ascended past that depth, those mixtures are no longer needed. So she starts ferrying those back, taking cameras, scooters, those bottles as well. Um, during the next four hours, uh, both Katie and Alex will continue to rotate, maintaining a presence in the water um, and I'll just pass it off to Mike so you can talk a little bit more about that the decompression phase and some of the risks that the divers face. Sure. Uh, obviously, boredom is probably one of the, the biggest <laughs> <laughs> threats. Okay. Because as Adam pointed out, you know, you're, you're floating in the, this empty blue for three to five hours. Uh, so you know, managing that, managing obviously temperature, uh, thermal considerations, you want to stay warm. So uh, typically, these are very benign conditions, the water temperatures right now at the end of summer are quite warm. But if let's say you had a puncture in your dry suit at depth and you're taking water and you put your dry suit, then obviously you're, you're losing heat a lot quicker because you're wet. Uh, so there's a lot of risk that you have to take into consideration on decompression. Evan knows all about right, that, yeah. Yeah. All, all too yeah. well. And then we also, you know, because we're in the water for a long time, we're also managing hydration. We actually have a support that bringing liquids down to us as well as energy bars uh, to avoid print, which I experienced. <laughs> uh, so there's all sorts of stuff you try to, to manage uh, during decompression and uh, having gases coming down uh, to swapping gases out here yep. and just really trying to get comfortable and making sure you're, you're kind of just uh, mellowing out and uh, getting to the surface safely. And, and Evan had mentioned earlier, the other primary uh, well, not primary, but, uh, but an important part of the support team is communication. Um, one of the dive team, one of us every day is what we call a dive supervisor or a dive marshal. Um, that person's on the hard boat, on the, on the deck of the boat. They're not diving and they are managing their dive team. They are questioning where they are in the water column. And as Richie Stevenson was the, um, Dive Marshal today, I'm going to ask, why don't you tell him what your job was? <laughs> yeah, no, no hiding in the corner, boy. Come on. Um, sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, right, front and how center. Much, how much time has everyone got? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a dive marshal in five hours. So if you want a minute by minute flow, then I guess we'll just talk you through from minute one. So, yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't uh, diving today, which is really tough to see all your mates jumping off the boat, leaving you behind. Uh, Felt a little kind of like I'd done something wrong for a, for, a, for a few minutes, but it was just my turn, and that's the way it goes. We all rotate out to to cover that role. Um, and actually, um, I would I would like to say that really, as a dive marshal, my job was made massively easier by the fact that I had three people plus the boat skippers who were actually the real dive marshals of the day, and um, I was just there to to help them as much as they were to help me. And uh, it was made straightforward by the fact that. All the guys around me know what they're doing, which is great. Well, most of them do. And um, and the, the dive went super smoothly as all the others have. So um, and that was that was the role. And you are just there really to manage anything if it did happen, which it has happened before, but we can't uh, we can't rule that out. It was just a matter of being able to manage that situation should it occur. So um, it's a team effort. We've got everything that we need to to cope with anything that happens. To make it a bit more complicated, just a, another detail, 
we not only have the complication on the water, but we are on a shipping lane in the channel. So <laughs> another big issue is that we have big, huge container carriers that are going up and down. There is a one mile exclusion zone for this expedition, but as you can understand, there are ships that are coming from the Dardanelles to go to the Mediterranean and after to the Atlantic Sea. And uh, sometimes the captain can be there or someone else can be uh, having coffee. or having coffee. So <laughs> it depends if while they're passing through Greece, they read the specific one uh, mile exclusion zone. So it's quite challenging. Sometimes you hear this prop, these huge props, uh, getting very close and you really hope oh, yeah. to uh, uh, hear the prop going away, but sometimes <laughs> it looks like if it's really close, so you can hear it's the interesting. You can it's hear the engine. engine, you hear the propeller, and you hear the engine. Yeah, Mike and I are both looking at each other because we had one other really incredible feature and danger today that we weren't really expecting, which, uh, uh, and, and Barry even got it on film, or at least the reaction, because we were all sitting there minding uh, and a beautiful, beautiful channel. We didn't want to rub it in with Rich, but it was the best dive of the trip. Oh boy. Um, oh, you will. Until, <laughs> until uh, all of a sudden out of nowhere, there was a massive explosion and a shock wave that literally went through the chest of everybody yeah. to the point where everyone immediately, you're looking around to see what the heck blew up. I yeah. mean, you think a tank blew up? We or, thought one of us blew up. Yeah. And uh, it turns out there's some dynamite fishing going on around the uh, on another island or something, but uh, but yeah, that was a little sketchy. <laughs> and, yeah, and dynamite fishing, on, even would have thought that was something quickly, in the past. We've got it easy because before we even get to the dive shop, and after we leave the dive shop, Giannis and the other captain of the other boat and George, they're working before even before we go diving. Uh, Giannis heads out into the channel to make sure that over the night a uh, ship didn't run over the buoy. He goes out and checks the conditions. Then he comes back and tells us. So, I mean, these guys are working truly 17, 18 hour days. Well, excellent. Well, hey, I'm gonna pass over to Rebecca for the second question. I know you had an interesting sinking question, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, so um, I'm just wondering if it's been absolutely determined that the Britannic was sunk by a uh, mine planted by German U-boats. Um, and some months, I guess it was uh, in, in the summer of 1916. Um, quite a number, I watched um, interviews um, and Jack Cousteau, of course, discovered the, the Britannic in 1975 and made a wonderful film about it um, that I enjoyed watching, but he also um, interviewed many of the survivors. I guess it was uh, 1,030 survived, 30 perished um, when it sank um, in under an hour. But um, many of the survivors in interviews were convinced that it sank as a result of two torpedo hits. In fact, the majority who Cousteau interviewed um, held very strong, firmly in that belief. One person said he was convinced it was a mine. And I'm just wondering where that determination stands now and, and what you may have learned in that regard. I, I think we would need another grant to really get to the bottom of that one uh, because that's, that's a very loaded question. No, uh, but, uh, and I'm gonna actually, I'm going to let Simon, the owner of the shipwreck, answer that briefly, Simon, briefly. <laughs> Very briefly. Um, it's a long-standing argument in the Titanic world, and it drives a lot of people nuts. But the honest truth is we think we've, um, well, we know, we've um, proved it was a mine. Uh, yes, there were two people who saw torpedoes on the day that the Titanic sank in November 1916. But the problem is they both saw that a different end of the ship and on different sides. Um, so their evidence was by no means conclusive. Um, so we were determined in 2003 to locate um, a fragment of the mine casing, if you like. Um, it was my first trip to Carl Spencer, actually, in um, 2003. And we had a guy called Bill Smith, a sonar expert from England, Newcastle. And he was deliberately tasked with going out there in the Keir Channel and mowing the lawn with his sonar until we found the fragment. Which we did find, uh, and more or less in the place that the German captain said he'd laid the minefield. But we weren't able to actually visualize it on a photographic camera until about uh, 2008 with El Cathay. 
But the point is, yes, the minefield was located in 2003, and uh, five years later, we went out there and we actually visualised the broken casing on the seabed. So there's no doubt it was a mine. Thank you. And I think you already answered uh, my question about the greatest challenge i mean it seems like it's it's ongoing challenges and it's an incredibly complex expedition but um you know what would you consider thus far to have been your greatest challenge in carrying out the expedition and how did you manage that uh covid <laughs> to be quite honest uh, i mean um, i have to say yeah. that we were working on the paperwork for over two years we were supposed to be here last year, but COVID just completely wiped us out. Uh, then we were thinking about coming back in May of this year, but we decided to put it back a little bit so the dive team could work up to the depths that we're actually going to be working at on the Britannic. Um, but I mean, uh, we've been working very closely with the Greek government now for two or three years, and we really were set to go last year, but the whole world changed completely beyond anyone's recognition. So. I think the most frustrating thing has been sitting here waiting and praying that we had actually come this year because two months ago, I wasn't certain we'd make it. I was hoping, I was really hoping, but by no means certain. Well, uh, well, well hey guys, let me, let me, if I may, let me jump into some questions that came from our viewers. Uh, first one I'll, I'd like to pass on to you actually came through YouTube, so we don't have a name uh, associated with a question. Uh, but the, the question is, uh, will the whole footage of your exterior and interior ultimately be available in some way for others or, or or how will this footage you know be seen by anyone yeah i mean ultimately it, it, it's all sort of embargoed for a year or so while uh it gets analyzed and i don't think anything's really going to be uh released in a major way until um until the recovery work is is done but uh we are absolutely once we have permission from the effort and everybody else involved, all the stakeholders. Um, I mean, we will absolutely put stuff out. And I, I mean, most, of you, well, at least half the table here are authors of, uh, you know, articles, books. We've done, I mean, numerous documentaries over the years, and and we we want this to get out there. We don't, we're not, we don't, we don't have any interest in just sitting here and and sitting on it. But at the same time, uh, we do need to give everybody that. Uh, has a stake, the time to analyze it. So uh, I would say it's probably going to be about a year before we do any uh, major release of all the footage, but um, I, I'm certain we're going to get a little bit out there before then. Yeah, the, so. the key to it right. is really, um, And uh, uh, this, uh, Kathy Crush asks a question really that should, I think, go to Katie, um, the ferrying of bottles and cameras, et cetera. Uh, are you doing a series of, you know, bounce dives? Uh, do you hit a decompression limit? Do you have to do decompression? How, do, how does that, your dives work? So I do a series of bounce dives. I usually will remain shallow for quite a while until the team can get to a certain point. And then once they would like to hand over their bottles, I collect as many pieces of equipment as they possibly want to give me. And then I continue back up, hand them off to the boat and return down to about 20 feet where the entire process starts again. So I'm on a rebreather as well, and that really gives me an extreme limit of no decompression limit. Right, got it. Uh, and uh, Mary Blake asks, uh, you know, the cohesiveness of the team and their dedication to the mission, uh, you know, leave, leaves her at least one gobsmack to, to be this specifically what she said, uh, you know, and uh, she also asks, you know, about, you know, the ownership of the remains and how that relates to the Greek government or others, you know, how is ultimate preservation going to be determined? Um, you know, what's the, what's the long-term outcome, not only of just this dive series, but the, you know, what's going to happen to the wreck? I mean, you already mentioned that it's eventually going to deteriorate into nothing, and maybe you'll be able to pull some stuff up in the museums, but between now and, and then what else uh, can happen around ownership? Well, I mean, I think it's a, I know Simon's going to jump in on this too, but I mean, one of, one of the big things in terms of conservation is that um, this is part of an ongoing project, uh, a very large scale photogrammetry mapping project to uh, as much as we can sort of capture and, and preserve the wreck digitally. Um, I mean, we have things that we can do now that, we, that, that just couldn't be done at all in 2009 and, and really are coming to their own. So 
Um, that that's certainly a big part. The fact that it's in Greece and Greece has incredibly strict um, uh, diving law, uh, laws and regulations um, stops. The, I mean, really, just stops any um, you know a lot of the the traffic uh, that might be coming back and forth to the wreck. You know, they, they make it they make it not difficult, not impossible, but they they make you go through the paces. You need to get permits. It's regulated in that it actually protects the wreck as well. And uh, as far as like the long-term conservation, I know Simon, you're probably chomping at the bit. Go. <laughs> no, I mean um, two minutes. <laughs> no, Evan's quite right. It, it is complicated out here. I mean, this is basically stage two. Stage one was building the exterior over the past years. Before we start the thing with the conservation of the beavers, we have to complete internal filming. We have to work out what needs to come up and why. But it's much as case of going down there and grabbing everything you see. Evan's quite right. The, the Greek government take their their cultural antiquities very, very seriously. And okay, I may be the owner of the UK title to the wreck, but there is still a very clearly defined line that I, I cannot cross. I have to sort of sign the same paperwork that any other expedition has to do. The only difference here, of course, is that we're going inside. Um, any recreation ship coming to the planet will never be allowed to go inside the wreck, nor will they be allowed to remove anything from it. So this is really a major step forward working with Greek government. So um, we now start talking in the new year once we've finished analysing the footage we have about the next stages, which could include the of conservation. But that's a, a discussion for another day. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, fellow explorer Michael Dubno, who uh, just this last March, I was out on a submersible dive trip down to the Mariana Trench with, uh, he asks uh, about human remains. I, I think I heard the number 35 people apparently perished on board the ship. Uh, I, I personally would imagine there, there probably are not human remains, but maybe there are artifacts of the, those people that still might be present. Uh, what do you see from a hum, human aspect and uh, what are you doing, uh, you know, uh, to honor or observe that? Well, I can start by saying the number's 30, 30 killed. Um, and in theory, there should be no bodies inside the wreck whatsoever. Because all the people who were killed on the day were killed in a lifeboat on the surface by a propeller. So they didn't actually go down with the ship. Uh, the ship is actually, as far as we are aware, completely empty. And we'll find no human remains in there at all. Ah, fantastic. Uh, and uh, Philippe uh, Jordeo, uh, he was asking, what about visibility and currents? It actually looked pretty clear based on the video clip we saw, but uh, are there currents down there or any other, uh, you know, other than the, I saw some maybe visibility issues you kicked up yourself. Uh, but, uh, you know, other than that, uh, how's the visibility down there? You know, I mean, it, it's the, the visibility itself on the outside is uh, not as good as we typically have, but we have zero current, which is very odd. And uh, we've sort of come to the consensus and George, who's been down there a number of times, um, we, we tend to believe that when the current is moving, uh, the visibility is better now. But but bad visibility is still, I don't know, what, 80, 90 feet. Yeah. I mean, it, it's still pretty good. And then when you're inside the wreck, you'd never really notice a limit to your visibility until you kick it up. I mean, you know, it's 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 really how powerful are your lights um, and and whatnot. I mean, if you're on the bottom of the wreck and you have and, and inside and you look up and there happens to be a hole, you see that hole very distinctly. So um, visibility there isn't the issue. It's just lack of light. We were decompressing and uh, at 160 feet, we could see the surface. So. That, that's how the visibility was in the water column. And, and I mean, the, the currents are just, it, it's amazing. They're just non-existent this particular trip. We I mean, we were here in uh, 2016 for an external project and we had a diving bell and the currents were so bad that it flipped the diving bell. Uh, and it, it was- on its cable. Yeah, I mean, it was, in, it was in, incredible. Um, that's what we were used to and that's what we were half expecting. In fact, we've, we've had to, make little modifications because the current here is so minimal this trip. And hopefully we'll stay so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, David Press uh, asked sort of a forward looking question to you about technical diving. Uh, he's saying, you know, in the next 10 years, uh, you know, is it likely that, you know, there are inventions on the horizon which are going to significantly enhance underwater expeditions and scientific research. And I'm going to layer that into something I, I, somebody else had actually asked a little earlier that I, I hadn't get, that didn't have a chance to ask, which is uh, uh, they had thought about you know diving bells or other semi-pressurized uh, you know things you could take down there. 
if there's any advantage or opportunity from a safety standpoint to have something like that with you down in the water column. So what's it like now compared to the future for both the diving and uh, capturing? Well, in 2016, Evan and I made a series of dives that some of our team members called the million dollar dive. Um, some of our team were on scooters and they scooted around the wreck and Evan and I followed them in a Triton submersible. Uh, when they were done with their 30 or 40 minute dive, they began their four hour decompression. And Evan and I in that submersible continued to document the outside of the wreck. So for working outside the wreck and, and imaging it, uh, obviously a submersible is a very expensive, but more efficient because you get a lot more bottom time, um, but at a greater cost. Obviously the diving operation requires a larger boat. It was two submersibles, but for our work inside, um, even an ROV, uh, or a remotely operated vehicle, a robot on a tether would be quite limited to, to what we're doing. You'd have to have six ROVs with operators going in six different directions and then have to worry about all those cables that would be following them. So the robots for what we're doing would not be as efficient. And, we, and we've all seen the wonderful work James Cameron has done on Titanic. We could have done better. If he would have had divers, they would have got better images. We all know it, right? Okay, Because that's what exploration is. It's about putting a man or a woman in, in, on the ground and in the field and looking around that corner and, and intuiting what it is you're looking at. And, and sometimes that just means changing the angle, which you don't always have with an ROV. So, I mean, I, I think in interior exploration, what we're doing, we are the best tool. Yeah, and we could also add that in the last 20 years, the introduction of uh, closed circuit rebreather uh, versus uh, open circuit has uh, uh, extremely uh, improved the boundaries of uh, uh, exploration in terms of depth and time that we could spend. So we have had in the last 20 years uh, uh, um, a, a great increase in the results of exploring at depth. When I mean at depth, I mean human depth, which means that for us divers, we can be there. Uh, that will, it wouldn't have been possible without this, uh, well, not invention, but without the diffusion of this uh, technology that are closed circuit rebreather, which is exactly uh, with different features. The same thing that an astronaut, when he goes out of a spaceship, uh, is wearing. So. It's, it's, it's something that before it was just for the military and it was a technology that was there. <clears throat> Nowadays, we have this technology available for sport divers that on Sundays they go like all of us diving. So this has made a great improvement and technology goes fast. So uh, we definitely are gonna see some, some something new or some improvements on this type of equipment. We're also seeing you know, drastic leaps in battery technology, lighting technology, camera technology. Yeah, so yeah. everything's getting smaller and, and longer lasting. Yeah. And so it's, it also benefits us. There's also, I mean, we, we, we've we even talked to, uh, there was a, an Italian submersible that had a lockout chamber that was on a, on a there's, there's the billionaire network of, of people that own, uh, you know, high net worth value. They own these yachts and they own some really interesting submersibles and they're not being utilized well. And so one of the things we try to do is, uh, you know, partner whenever we can. And there was there was one in particular that was kind of the dream because it could do lockouts at up to 400 foot. And then, uh, you know, so you could go down and conceivably do, you know, a several hour dive on the bottom, go into the submersible, come back up on the ship and then go spend your time in a um, uh, in a habitat, in a chamber. But I mean, we can all imagine the horror stories and logistics and we've, we've all been here and operated in this current and seen, uh, you know, submarines and ROVs get pushed off the wreck. So there's, there's, I mean, with, with every, with every new tool, there's some kind of trade-off and it's, it's a constant risk analysis, at least when, when humans are involved. I mean, we, we build robots that are designed to go inside shipwrecks and, you know, they may cost a quarter million dollars, but, you know, what is that in comparison to a life? So, I mean, the only thing I'd push back on with, with what Richie was saying is that, yes, I completely agree that we are the best tool, but there is an efficiency that we bring to the table um, 
but it's a limited efficiency. We go down in 30 minute segments. I can put it, if, if you've got the ship and you've got all this other backup um, uh, logistics to support it, you could have several ROVs that just sit in there. When we did work in the Arizona, we'd work for eight hours in a small little room, turn the lights off, come back in the morning, and then fire up the ROV. It's a little bit more difficult, of course, in the channel, but that technology does exist. And if there was, um, you know, somebody willing to fund that, we'd certainly give it a shot. So, hey, well, I've just got a couple more questions for you. I know we're holding you all up from uh, going in, uh, uh, getting your dinner and, and and cycling down and back up for first thing in the morning. Uh, so we won't keep you too much longer. Uh, Steve Vardman uh, asks a very specific question. What type of cameras uh, and uh, recording gear are you all using down there on the Britannic? Uh, th this is, like we mentioned earlier, this is not sort of a, 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 a cinema project. So we are, we're, we're using personal gear, which is uh, for the most part, uh, let's see, an a Sony A7S, a Nikon Z7, and uh, what else are you guys shooting? Yes. Oh yeah, D850 and uh, an S1H. Power, Power Lens. Lens is a big supporter on this project, which has been actually very cool because uh, typically on something like this, we work in two man teams. So we have one photographer who's leading, and then the second person is running the reel and, and providing additional lighting and doing uh, additional exploration, of course, right behind them. But um, we, we sort of have a rule that if you're, if you're the one that's number two running the line, you're not carrying a camera because it's, it's, it's way too easy to, to go down the rabbit hole of like, oh, what's that? And the next thing you know, your, your partner is gone, you're lost, and, and who knows what happens. You're late. So... <laughs> So Paralens, uh, it's a pretty cool little camera. You can wear it on your mask and it's giving us uh, extra data that we would not have had before. So that's that's something that we haven't done uh, on any of these projects. Excellent. And now uh, I'm gonna give William Bauer's question sort of the, the final position here. Um, and I'm gonna insert just a, a question of my own along the side of it, which is he's asking about the deterioration rate of this wreck compared to others you've dove uh, obviously, the depth and temperature and other life forms in the area will uh, affect that significantly. Uh, so how do you kind of rate this wreck on its deterioration rate? And, and that made me think of, uh, you know, having uh, been down to the Titanic uh, myself, you know, uh, and since they were sister ships, one of the things you could see in the Titanic were the chandeliers hanging down. Uh, I don't know if when it was, when this was requisitioned by the military, if they stripped it of a lot of that stuff or if you see that. So what does it look like in the sense of opulence and how fast is it deteriorating compared to others? I, well, I think it, compared to Titanic, the fact uh, that she's on her side um, and whatnot, some of those really neat features that you see on Titanic, like chandeliers and stuff, you just don't, you don't see it in quite the same manner. Um, and there is quite a bit of, of deterioration on the inside. I, it's, I don't know if it's more or less than, uh, than Titanic, um, but but it's 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 extreme. Um, I mean, the outer hull looks fantastic, and when you go inside, part of what we're trying to figure out is you know we have these blueprints from Titanic, from Olympic, and we we think there should be rooms and partitions, and sometimes we go in and there's nothing there, and we're trying to figure out okay, is that because it's rotted away or because they were never put in in the first place? And there's no photos, so the photos right. that we're taking, the video we're bringing back. Are they are going to be the only images, the only record of Britannic? And if we don't record it and get it down now, eventually when the wreck does biologically implode, it'll be gone forever and we'll never get the answers to those questions or those images. Yeah. I think what we're also seeing too, you know, in the past, we've seen just from the exterior, it looks quite intact. Yep. But now we're going inside, I think we're all seeing it's a facade. We're seeing decks yeah. bowing, we're seeing a lot of collapse, a lot. It's it's obviously that uh, yeah. you know the, the, the clock is ticking on this wreck. How would you guys put it though, like in comparison to other wrecks of roughly the same age? You know, I mean, yeah. especially here in the Mediterranean, Eduardo, you probably and George for that matter, you guys might have some of the most experience sort of in this general well, area. Let's put it this way. Uh, sorry, I'll just say a word first. Uh, I, I, 
if I had to uh, plan like it is in the plan, Simon, uh, with the antiquities to and the effort to recover a specific artifacts, um, if I had to gamble, I wouldn't wait that long because the wreck itself is uh, definitely uh, suffering time. Uh, we don't have to forget that these ships had uh, been constructed with the technology and the material that were available at the time. So uh, it, it, it is suffering and uh, compared to other wrecks that I've seen in the Mediterranean, I would say that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going faster than what I would expect from uh, a wreck in this type of uh, uh, water with the salinity and oxygen uh, that is diluted in water. So my opinion is that it, 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 it will it will definitely last, but the the, the, the wreck will implode sooner or later and is uh, probably quite difficult to date it. Well, yes, um, the, the fact that they're still intact and they're still there and um, the dining stands and when we see it from the outside it, it, it's a whole ship and everything looks like uh, it's it's it, it's there um our experience from other wrecks uh and it's not only Mediterranean but all over the world is like it just takes a critical point and then from that critical point that something starts to collapse from the inside then the, the deterioration of the save and everything is just, it's, it's very fast. A house yeah. of cards, yeah. basically. So it's like, it's going to be like a house of cards. Starts, Once it starts. Yeah, really really yeah. Fast. So, a little uh, dynamite fishing. And, uh, yeah, yeah, well, in Greece, dynamite fishing is, is completely forbidden. So yeah. people are doing it completely illegal. And uh, also in the, in the last years, laws have been voted. So these kind of wrecks all over Greece have been nominated as monuments. So they're even more protected than before and uh, they try to conserve it. Uh, the only thing that uh, we, we need to say out there for anyone to, to understand and, and listen and do, Simon, and on all of us, is that uh, the, 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 the clock is ticking. Um, we might be one of the last generations that would be able to physically visit those wrecks. Agreed. And yeah. um, it's like a couple of different generations in, in this level. Uh, they're not going to last for long. 20, 15, one, one thing I'll add to that. Um, one thing worth adding is that um, we have done some basic um, steel tests on the Britannic, a uh, steel platform put down in 2003 with, uh, by Wicom. Uh, the initial test showed that Britannic is actually deteriorating faster than Titanic, like about two or three times. However, what has changed is that um, the thick uh, green coating on this is the stabilizer rate to a certain extent. But if you go inside where there is no coating, um, and you see the bare metal, and you are seeing holes coming through. So the prognosis when Britannic goes, and it will eventually go one day, it has to, uh, is that when the collapse comes, it may not be a slow, gradual collapse, it may be quite a, a quick collapse. And when you bear in mind the tectonic activity of this area, well, there are earthquakes in Greek region, whatever. It could just be an earthquake that sets it off. Um, so yes, uh, and while it's right, the clock is ticking. It's something we have to sit down and look at. This is why this footage is more important than ever. What we're doing on this bit could be crucial to how we plan conservation on the wreck in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I will say this though. I mean, we've we've all dove on on other wrecks that that went down. Um, you know, even later than this one and. I mean, they're yeah, they're, they're gone. gone. I mean, the fact. I mean, it's a real testament to to the shipbuilding that a hundred years later, on her side, no less, she's so still she's intact. still intact on the at least on the outside. It's pretty yeah. spectacular. I mean, she. I mean, she's beautiful. You know, to go and dive, and we're all we're all very privileged to to get that honor. Not to just not to just go down and touch her and have a look, but to really you know go inside, go inside and uh, and and help help. Preserve I mean, and are, bring there them are back. questions that are difficult to answer. If we look at the monumental size of the engines, they are bolt to uh, say the floor of the of the ship, and because she's sitting on one side, you, you wonder when this mass amount of metal will just uh, 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 fall well, down. Yeah, yeah, Hopefully, yeah. not in the next wait, week. Wait, wait, that's all. <laughs> it wasn't today. <laughs> yeah, <it> wasn't. <laughs> Well, well, really, I have to say, uh, uh, what a what a real pleasure it is to talk to all of you out there in Greece. 
uh, you know, the work you're doing is, uh, I think, exceptionally important from a historical standpoint. Uh, we're, we're very proud that you are bearing the Explorers Club flag with you out there, and so many of you are, are members. Uh, uh, really, thank you for taking time out of your very hard work schedule to, to make time for all of us uh, here at the club and around the world watching in, uh, choosing get, getting a chance to tune in. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for helping me uh, at this end, and Kevin and other staff here at the club for uh, helping to put all this together. Uh, and with that, you know, I'll just say thank you very much and good night. Enjoy your brief uh, rest before you hit it again in the morning. Calnita. Thank you. Calnita. Calnita. Thank you, Calnita. Yasu. <laughs>